So the pancreas is the most important exocrine and endocrine gland. It's mean it, it, it has like kind of a dual function. Uh, the, uh, the first part of the uh, pancreas is actually exocrine in function and the other part is endocrine in function. So actually uh, the exocrine gland is producing different kinds of the enzymes which are responsible for the digestion of the protein carbohydrates and some of them also responsible for the digestion of uh, fats. The endocrine function is particularly related to the beta cell and the alpha cells and also uh, there's some kind of D cells as well. So uh, we'll be discussing in today's topic about the pancreas, its uh, anatomy, its physiology and uh, different kinds of the uh, surgical anatomies which can be uh, which can be um, because of the developmental errors or because of the delayed development of the pancreas. So uh, let's just start uh, today's topic. First of all, we'll be talking about the surgical anatomy and uh, this is most important um, gland and it, it occupies the central uh, part of the abdomen, which is the epigastrium most commonly. So if a patient is uh, giving you some kind of symptoms related to the epigastrium, like the epigastric pain associated with vomiting, you'll uh, be thinking uh, about the pancreas and pathology with the pancreas other than the stomach. So if we actually divide the abdomen in the nine quadrants, so out of those nine quadrants, uh, it is actually located in the central part of the abdomen, which is the epigastrium. So if you could uh, appreciate this diagram, you can see here that uh, this is the right and the left kidneys. And uh, uh, to the right is the inferior vena cava and to the left is the aorta. So it is actually occupying a central position because these two main vessels, they are situated behind the pancreas. And if we talk about uh, the uh, enclosure of the pancreas, it is actually a retroperitoneal peritoneal structure. So it is, it, it is actually in the retroperitoneum, right? And it occupies its uh, the C-shaped curve of the duodenum, actually. We know that the uh, stomach, uh, um, you know, with the pyloric end, it, it, it is actually connected with the duodenum, and the duodenum is actually, uh, it's divided into four parts. The first part is horizontal, the second part is more vertical, and then and we know that the third part is again uh, transverse or the horizontal position and the fourth part is going down, which is connected to the jejunum below. But it's, it's actually the pancreas is, uh, you know, central in the position and the C-shaped curve of the duodenum or the C-shaped loop of the duodenum is the part which is enclosed by the pancreas. You can also appreciate in the diagram that this is the right kidney and you can see the portal vein. I'll be talking about uh, the important relationships of the pancreas because because it, it's, it is actually occupying a very central position. So it's related to very important structures like the, it's related to the, because it's a retroperitoneal structures and we know that uh, the, both the kidneys are also retroperitoneal structures. So uh, it, it's kind of important then because it's actually uh, you know, uh, extending from the epigastrium to the splenic hilum in the left hypochondrium. So you can actually see the portal vein, the inferior vena cava. This is the uh, main abdominal aorta. And you can also see the splenic veins as well uh, because they are actually these splenic veins are then entering into the, they are combining this splenic artery uh, because this splenic artery is actually you know, related to the tail of the pancreas and the body of the pancreas. And the splenic vein down here, it's coming from the spleen and actually combining with the portal vein. And, uh, you know, it's actually combining with the superior mesenteric. This is the superior mesenteric vein. And this is the, uh, and this actually, they're combining together and they're making the portal vein. You can see the left kidney in the diagram as well. And this is the spleen. Okay. 
So the thing which is important to know is the pancreas is divided into four parts, right? Uh, the head of the pancreas, the neck of the pancreas, the body of the pancreas, and the tail of the pancreas. There's another part which is called the ansonate process. You can see here, uh, like almost this portion down here is the ansonate process. This is the head of the pancreas. This is the neck of the pancreas. And almost this whole of the region is the body of the pancreas and this is the tail of the pancreas which is actually entering into the splenic hilum. Uh, why I am em emphasizing this anatomy because it's 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 surgical anatomy is very important and uh, if any kind of the uh, carcinoma of the head of, of the head of the pancreas it can actually, um, you know, compress the duodenum. It can, it can involve the most important structures like the inferior vena cava and the portal vein. So, if we talk about the relationships of uh, the uh, structures related to the head of the pancreas, you can see here just behind the head of the pancreas, uh, you can see the inferior vena cava. So, the most important structure which is passing behind the head of the pancreas is the inferior vena cava. So, if there's a, a tumor which is involving the head of the pancreas, the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas, it actually will compress the inferior vena cava. And because of the compression of the inferior vena cava, the patient uh, will have a kind of a venous pooling and generalized edema, especially in the lower limbs. So the important structure which is related to the head of the pancreas is the inferior vena cava, which is located behind the head of the pancreas. Then you can also see this is the neck of the pancreas, right? And this is the portal vein. So actually, this portal vein is also important really related to the head and the neck of the pancreas as well. Then this is the superior mesenteric veins. Uh, behind the head of the pancreas, we have the superior mesenteric veins as well, like the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric vein. And just in front of the neck of the pancreas, the superior mesenteric vein is uh, behind the head of the pancreas, but front of the neck of the pancreas. And uh, the important structure which is related to the tip of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas is obviously the spleen which is located behind that. So always keep in mind that the important structures uh, like you know also because we know that the if we particularly talk about the relationship the right kidney important the spleen is also important because spleen is just uh, because it's also part of the retroperitoneum so the kidneys are also retroperitoneum so actually they are moreover related to that and also because it transversely arranged in the epigastrium and it and the uh, you know, the tail of the pancreas is actually extending into the splenic hilum. So always keep in mind the two main vessels, the inferior vena cava and the aorta, they are located uh, behind the pancreas and any tumor which is involving the pancreatic head it's going to compress the aorta and it's going to compress the inferior vena cava as well. Plus, uh, the portal vein is also located uh, behind the uh, behind the head of the pancreas. So, two important structures which are located behind the head of the pancreas: the one is the inferior vena cava, and the other is the portal vein. And the superior mesenteric vessels, uh, superior mesenteric vein is in front of the uh, neck of the pancreas and uh, the aorta is behind the neck of the pancreas. So these, the, you can see here in the diagram that this is actually the splenic artery. So the splenic artery is actually uh, important to in relation to the uh, body of the pancreas. So this is a spleen and it's this is a splenic artery and it's going all the way down here uh, uh, from just on the top of the pancreatic body and it's uh, you know just supplying the spleen. Plus uh, you can see here that this is the actually the splenic vein. This is the splenic vein right because it's coming from the spleen. 
so and this is the you can see here like this is this is the superior mesenteric vein so actually this superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein they're combining together and just behind the neck of the pancreas they're forming the portal vein so this is somehow uh, a very important relationship of the pancreas with a portal vein. The splenic vein, which is coming from the splenic hilum, and it's along with the superior mesenteric vein. You can see here, this is superior mesenteric vein. It's, you know, the superior mesenteric vein is up the, in front of the uncinate process. This is the uncinate process. And you can see here the superior mesenteric vessels, they are in front of the uncinate process, but they are behind the head and neck of the pancreas, right? So uh, it's actually the superior mesenteric vein, and here is the uh, splenic vein, and the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein, uh, you know, uh, just behind the head of the pancreas, they are actually, um, the neck of the pancreas, they're actually combining and joining to form the portal vein. This relationship is important. I'm going to discuss it uh, later when we'll be discussing about the pathologies. Uh, so... Uh, the, this is important to know the relationships of the pancreas. We have the oncinate process. We have the um, head of the pancreas. We have the neck of the pancreas. We have the body of the pancreas. And then we have the tail of the pancreas. So the superior mesenteric vessels, they lie in front of the oncinate process. Behind the head of the pancreas is the inferior vena cava. So you can see here in the diagram that this is actually the splenic artery and, you know, uh, the, this is the splenic artery and this is splenic, uh, actually splenic vein and you can see the renal vessels as well. This is the left ureter, uh, which is also somehow related to the, uh, but it's, it's just, uh, you know, uh, behind the pancreas and this is superior mesenteric vein, right? So I told you that the superior mesenteric vein is actually located, it's, it's related to the uncinate process. It's in front of the uncinate process of the pancreas. You can see the right here as well. So the uncinate process uh, is related to the superior mesenteric vein uh, because it's located in uh, in front of the uncinate process. Then the head of the pancreas, uh, the portal vein, and the uh, you know the inferior vena cava. They're located behind the head and somehow neck of the pancreas. And the aorta is just behind the uh, behind the body uh, of the pancreas. And the, this tip is uh, you know related to the but the most important thing is like, you know, the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein, uh, they both join together and behind the neck of the pancreas, they are forming the portal vein. Right. Okay. So uh, there's another diagram which, which will tell you about a little bit about the different parts of the pancreas head this is the uncinate process, which, which was actually extending down and the superior mesenteric vein was related to it. And this is the head of the pancreas, this is the neck of the pancreas, this is the body of the pancreas, and this is the tail of the pancreas, right? But another important thing is like, you know, the pancreas has got an exocrine function as well and the endocrine function as well. So, you know, uh, it, the pancreas is actually, uh, there's a lot of SNI, and these they are these SNI are actually arranged into lobules and the ductules. They're kind of the beta cells and the alpha cells and the D cells. So the beta cells, like seventy percent of the cells in the pancreas, they're the beta cells. So the beta cells are responsible for the production of the insulin, and the alpha cells they're the they're responsible for the production of glucagon. And uh, the D cells, which are responsible for the production of the somatostatin. So, the beta cells, which produces the insulin, so we know the function of the insulin is to convert the glucose into the glycogen. And readily available glucose is actually converted into the glycogen. And we know that glycogen is deposited in the fats and obviously the adipose tissue uh, and the liver as well. And the alpha cells, they have a kind of opposite function as compared to the beta cells. So they actually secrete the glucagon. So the glucagon is responsible for the conversion 
of stored glycogen into the glucose whenever in a condition of like starvation or fasting uh, to, to provide instant source of energy to the, to the body, right? So, and the D cells, which are responsible for the production of somatostatin. So this somatostatin is actually uh, responsible for the inhibition of uh, uh, like insulin and glucagon both. So actually insulin uh, has got a opposite effect as compared to the glucagon. So insulin is actually converting the glucose into the stored glycogen. And that stored glycogen uh, in the conditions like this starvation or the, uh, you know, my f fasting conditions, the stored glycogen in, in the liver, muscles, and the adipose tissue is actually converted into the uh, uh, glucose to, to give the body an instant source of energy. And the D cells, the somatostatin, somatostatin is actually, you know, inhibiting both these secretions. So this was actually the endocrine part of the, um, uh, of the pancreas. If we talk about the exocrine function of the pancreas, this is something very important to know that these SNI cells, which are in the pancreas and the exocrine part of the pancreas, they're responsible for the production of different enzymes, especially uh, for the digestion of the carbohydrates, for the digestion of the proteins, and for the digestion of the fats as well. Like enzymes which are responsible is like the amylase, lipase, you know, the trypsin, enterokinase, chymotrypsin, responsible for the digestion of the protein. So, uh, so I hope you're cl clear, very much clear about the endocrine and the exocrine function. So, and you're also clear about the surgical anatomy of the pancreas. So you can also see that to do the, if we particularly talk about other relationships, the head of the pancreas is also related to the pancreatic adrenal artery. The ancillary process is related to the superior mesenteric vein because the superior mesenteric artery and the vein, they are in front of the ancillary process, but they're behind the neck of the pancreas, right? And uh, we know, actually, if we particularly talk about the anatomy, we know that actually, uh, you know, if we talk about the embryology, there are two buds, uh, the ventral pancreatic bud and the dorsal pancreatic bud. And the ventral pancreatic duct is forming the, um, uh, you know, the accessory pancreatic, and the dorsal is making the main pancreatic duct. And we know that this main pancreatic duct is just actually opening into the major duodenal papilla and uh, uh, you know, this major duodenal papilla is in the uh, second part of the duodenum, right? And the minor, the uh, papilla is actually, you know, the accessory pancreatic duct, it is actually uh, draining into the minor duodenal papilla. So, uh, and there's a sphincter, uh, like this is the ampulla of the vader, and this ampulla of the vader is encircling the major duodenal papilla, and it's actually controlling, because it's a kind of a sphincter, so it's, it's actually controlling the secretions of the main pancreatic duct. Uh, the common bile duct, why the pancreas is somehow very much related to the pathologies related to the CBD, uh, the common bile duct, because the common bile duct, along with the main pancreatic duct, they are uh, they are draining into the or uh, into the second part of the duodenum into the major duodenal papilla. So the thing, which is very much important uh, to understand, is like you know the C shape of the pancreas. So the um, important thing to know is like the C-shaped curve of the duodenum is, is actually enclosing the different parts of the pancreas. To understand the relationship of the head of the pancreas and the ducts which are opening into the second part of the duodenum, we're going to go for a, di a diagrammatic representation for that. So you can see here in, in this diagram that I'm trying to make the different parts of the duodenum to help you understand its relationship. So you can see here, like, this is the first part of the duodenum, and uh, there are other different kinds of the, um, uh, you know, different parts of the uh, pancreas which are related to uh, the C-shaped curve of the duodenum. So you can see here, like, this is the pancreas, and if we particularly, um, I'm going to label all these things in the end so that you can understand better. This is actually the liver, and we know that posterior surface of the liver, actually, we have the gallbladder on the posterior surface. 
And if we particularly talk about the ducts, so we know that the liver has like different SNI of the liver, you know, the hepatic SNI, they combine together, they form the hepatic ducts, which are the right and the left hepatic ducts, and then they combine together to form, to form actually the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct is actually, you know, this is the, you can see here, there's the gold bladder and there's the cystic duct. So actually, this is actually combining with the hepatic duct and making the important, uh, this is the common, uh, you know, the common bile duct. So if you could make here, this is the major duodenal papilla and this is the minor duodenal papilla. So this is the duct which is going into the, this is actually the, uh, you know, this is the common hepatic and you can see the pancreatic ducts as well. So this is the main pancreatic duct and this is the sassary pancreatic duct. So Actually, uh, you can see here that this is actually the uncinate process, right? So this is the uncinate process of the pancreas, right? So this is actually the head of the pancreas. This is actually the body of the pancreas. And this is the, uh, you know, the tail of the pancreas. So the important thing is this, that this is the common hepatic duct, right? And this is cystic duct. And actually, the cystic duct, along with the uh, common hepatic duct, they're making the common bile duct, which is actually CBD. So this CBD, you can see here, this is the CBD, and this is entering into the major duodenal papilla along with the main pancreatic duct, right? Main pancreatic duct. So this is main pancreatic duct, and it's opening into the uh, major duodenal papilla, right? You can see here, this is, sorry for that, major duodenal papilla. So if you could see here in the diagram that we have the uncinate process, which is actually the uh, in the C-shaped curve of the duodenum. We have the head of the pancreas, we have the body of the pancreas, and the tail of the pancreas. So actually the cystic duct from the gold bladder, it's combining with the common hepatic and it's forming the uh, common bile duct, CBD, and CBD along with the main pancreatic duct is opening into the major duodenal papilla, which is in the second part of the duodenum. So this is actually, this hole is the second part of the duodenum. So I hope so. That's a, uh, it's a, this diagram is going to help you understanding the concept uh, like for where's the major duodenal papilla, where's the minor duodenal papilla, and how these pancreatic ducts and the common bile duct is actually entering into the um, is entering into this major duodenal papilla. So let's get back to our presentation. So. Um, like I have put a lot of emphasis on the surgical anatomy because you know they're very important structures and somehow uh, when a patient is presenting to you with a jaundice and you have to do think about the obstructive jaundice or the patient is actually presenting with a pancreatitis, uh, these surgical um, you know landmarks and the surgical anatomy is very important. So, you know, like the, if we talk about the developmental process of the pancreas, starting from the fifth month, going to the 40th week of the fetal life, the pancreas, you know, they go a lot of variations and they go a lot of developmental processes. So actually these ventral and the, if, if there's a malrotation in the fifth week, in this, uh, you know, the dorsal pancreatic and the ventral pancreatic ducts, they can actually lead to the anal pancreas. We will we'll discuss about the anal pancreas later in the lecture. So, uh, you know, if we particularly talk about the variations, there's a progressive suppression of the sassary duct. You can see here in the diagram that this is actually, this is the duodenum, and this is, this is actually the, the, that second part of the duodenum, which has 
I've got the major and the minor adrenal papilla, and you can see the main pancreatic duct and the salivary duct. This is the normal anatomy, but there can be like you know the presence of the major and the minor pancreatic duct. There's a normal anatomy. It's about like sixty percent of the people, but there can be variations because of the developmental delay in the developmental errors of uh, like you can see here the, like there can be you know variations like the suppression of the sassy duct which is called as a centaurony and there can be uh, like other um, as well but sometimes because uh, their variations. So actually, this is the the accessory pancreatic duct. It is also emptying into the main uh, pancreatic duct. And if it's, if, if there's a suppression in the accessory pancreatic duct, uh, you know the the actually the main pancreatic duct is opening into the minor duodenal papilla as compared to the major duodenal papilla. So uh, there can be suppression of the sassary pancreatic duct or there can be suppression of the main pancreatic duct. So if there is a, the suppression of the sassary pancreatic duct, the main pancreatic duct is opening into the minor duodenal papilla. And if there's a suppression of the main duct, which is the versing, uh, if there's a suppression of the sassary pancreatic duct, then this is the centaurony. And the, if there's a suppression of the main duct, then this is versing, right? So you can see here, and appreciate that this is actually the worsening branch and there's an obstruction or there's a suppression of the main pancreatic duct, right? You can see here that actually this is the suppression of the main pancreatic duct. So uh, we'll be talking about the pancreatic divism as well because actually this this is actually dividing the pancreas. Just like, you know, we know that if there's a, a problem with the ventra, ventral pancreatic and the dorsal pancreatic ducts and they're unable to fuse with each other, uh, the problem is a pancreatic divism. We'll be talking about this in the later later part of the presentation. So the sphincter for dye, which is the, you know, this is somehow uh, very much important because the sphincter for dye is actually encircling that ampulla of the better part. And you can see here like, you know, the common hepatic, the common bile duct and the pancreatic, they have, um, they have a relationship important with the major adrenal papilla. And there's no actually sphincter mechanism which is existing between the protecting flow between the duct. So there can be variation in the sphincter of Udai as well, like there's a no sphincter mechanism, or there's a partial common channel, or there's a suppression of these two channels. You can see here this is actually the main pancreatic duct in a CBD, the common, the common bile duct. So sometimes there can be a no sphincter mechanism, uh, there can be a partial common channel, uh, you can see there's a like a partial common channel and after that they are fused with each other and they're emptying into the uh, major duodenal papilla. Or there can be separation of these two channels, right? Like you can see here in the diagram as well. This is the uh, inferior uh, cholidocal sphincter. There's an ampullary sphincter. There's a superior cholidocal sphincter and there's a pancreatic sphincter. So actually these to, uh, four of the sphincters, they combine together and they make the sphincter of the Adai. So you should remember the names of these sphincters. There's a superior cholidocal sphincter, which is the, um, you know, related to the CBD, inferior cholidocal sphincter, ampullary sphincter, which, which is actually around the ampulla of the vader, and there's a pancreatic sphincter. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, like you know, there there is a partial common channel, then there is a separate channel, and sometimes uh, they don't have a sphincter mechanism at all. So there can be, you know, the variation in this in the sphincter part as well. So whenever you are investigating the the pathology in the pancreas. Uh, there are some kind of the important uh, investigations. Like we start from the baseline investigations. Uh, okay, the but how the patient is actually going to present to you. The patient uh, with, uh, with a pancreatic pathology is going to come with the symptoms like there can be a nausea, there can be vomiting, there can be a severe epigastric pain, especially in case of the, uh, you know, the severe pancreatitis. 
and it's uh, if it's uh, uh, the carcinoma of the pancreas so we know that most commonly maybe the ampullary those ampullary carcinomas of the pancreas they actually they cause obstruction as well so the patient can present to you with the obstructive jaundice and the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas the patient can present to you with the uh, portal hypertension because it, it's going to compress the portal vein and it's going to compress the inferior vena cava as well and the patient can present to you with a generalized edema, pleural effusion, ascites, you know, um, all uh, the problems related to portal hypertension, right? So, uh, you start from very basic investigation. You ask for the blood CP of if there's a kind of acute pancreatitis or the infection, there would be a raised TLC, teratologicide count, with the differential in like in case of the uh, in case of the acute pancreatitis, uh, the neutrophilic neutrophilic count would be raised. Uh, you go for. Uh, serum mild laser and serum lipase uh, because when there's a pancreatic damage uh, you know obviously because of the pancreatic damage uh, these uh, enzymes would be released into the uh, blood right like into the serum actually so you order for the serum amylase and the serum lipase uh, serum amylase is like less expensive and serum lipase uh, is actually, you know, very sensitive and very specific. And if, we, if you're ordering for the serum amylase, a threefold increase of the serum amylase as compared to its normal value, uh, it's actually is important and it's considered to be significant. The other thing is you're going to go for the other tests as well, like you're going to go for the pancreatic function, functional test. So there are a lot of uh, uh, tasks uh, available for that of uh, like you perform the lenic task you give uh, intravenous or the oral um, oral uh, you know some kind of uh, the um, substances uh, and you you actually measure the quantity in the urine right because if they are undigested uh, by the pancreas they're going to come into the urine and their level would be raised obviously so automatically uh, those are also important so generally but as a routine investigation you go for uh, the you order the blood cp you order for the serum amylase and serum lipase so Starting from the uh, very basic investigations like the ultrasonography, what actually the ultrasound is going to tell you? Obviously, the ultrasound is going to tell you about the, uh, you know, if there's a pathology in the most commonly because the there are a lot of causes of the pancreatitis. So, you know, it will tell you if um, most commonly there's some pathology or a stone in the CBD or the common, uh, you know, the common bile duct and there's a stone in the gallbladder as well. So uh, the pancreatitis is because of those gallstone, which is gallstone induced pancreatitis or the biliary pancreatitis. There can be other multiple causes, you know, the alcohol, the smoking, the surgery. Um, there can be other causes, but I'm going to tell you those when we're talking about the causes of acute pancreatitis. But today we're just um, are talking as a general. So uh, the ultrasound is going to tell you about the, uh, you know, the stones in the CBD or the stones in the gallbladder. And it's going to tell you about the pancreatic thickness or the peripancreatic fluid, uh, which is present in case of the acute pancreatitis. And sometimes it can also pick up the lesions, like the, there's a tumor there can be a hypoechoic dense lesions um, on the head of the pancreas, you know. So ultrasound is, you know, uh, kind of important. And it, it gives you kind of the basic investigation, basic information uh, regarding the uh, status of the pancreas. And it can tell you about the mass as well. You can see here in the diagram. So the CT is a gold standard because CT is, uh, you know, uh, the, you order the CT uh, for a pancreatic pro protocol. First of all, you do the CT without contrast, and, and then you order for the um, uh, contrast enhanced CT scan in which a dye is injected or the oral contrast is given, and then you can actually appreciate. So if you could see in this diagram, there are multiple things which, can, which you can see in the chronic pancreatitis. 
like in, in case of the chronic pancreatitis, there can be dilatation of the CFB day, there can be dilatation of the, uh, you know, pancreatic ducts, there can be, uh, because because of the chronic pancreatitis, they are actually formation of the strictures, so you can actually pick up the stricture as well. They keep, there would be calcification as well. So uh, you can you can go for a plain CT, uh, and after that you're gonna go for the intravenous contrast or the contrast enhanced CT scan. So you can see here in the contrast enhanced CT scan, like this is the gold ladder, and this is the uh, the triad, the charcoal triad actually. This is the common bile duct, and this is the this actually this is the common uh, this is the common bile duct. This is the portal vein, and this is actually the uh, pancreatic. Uh, duct as well. So you can see the dilatation of the ducts as well. And the uh, CECT, like the contrast enhanced CT scan, is also going to tell you information about the if there's a mass or the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas or there is a tumor related to the body of the pancreas or the ampullary carcinoma. So it's going to tell you about the thickness of the pancreatitis, uh, thickness of the pancreas, and it's also going to tell you about the about the uh, status of the gallbladder, if the gallbladder is distended or not. And also, uh, it's going to uh, tell you about the necrosis as well, because uh, the part of the pancreas, which is necrotic, that is not going to take the contrast. So you can actually get the information. So the, uh, this is considered to be a very important investigation so CCT is like you can differentiate between acute, acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis. It can pick up the mass as well, the status of the CBD and the status of the gallbladder as well. So you can see distended gallbladder, dilated bile duct. You can see the uh, yeah superior mesenteric vein as well. So there can be a thrombus in the superior mesenteric vein. There's the main pancreatic duct. So CT is kind of very very much important. Uh, in case of that, and if in case of the, uh, uh, you know, the tumors, the endocrine tumors like the insulinoma, uh, there can be hypervasculature, which can be picked up in the hypervascular insulinoma, can be picked up in the CT, and if there's a large pseudocyst um, in the pancreas, that can also be picked up by the uh, CT scan, right? So CT is a very important and uh, helpful and significant uh, investigation. The other investigation is the magnetic resonance imaging, which is the MRI. So we usually go for the uh, MRCP, which is magnetic resonant cholangiopancreaticogram, which is also showing up the whole of the track for the uh, the CBD, the cystic duct, uh, uh, you know, and the common ball duct and the status of the pancreatic duct as well. So the MRCP, you can see here actually, that this is the gallbladder and just close to the gallbladder, this is the cystic duct, right? So these are the hepatic ducts and hepatic right and the left hepatic ducts, they're combined together and they're making a common bile duct. Common bile, uh, these hepa common hepatic ducts. So the common hepatic is actually combined with the cystic and it's making up the CBD, uh, which is the, uh, you know, which is the um, uh, uh, common bile duct. So you can see actually the status of the common bile duct as well. There's this tone, there's a dilatation of the CBD, which is actually can tell you about the, um, if any kind of a stone is present in the CBT. So there's another important investigation, which is the ERCP. MRCP is less expensive and uh, it gives you more of the information. In case of ERCP, you have to put the endoscope into the patient and then through the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram, uh, you can actually visualize the whole of the tract and you can, if there's obstruction, if there's a stone in the CBD, which is actually causing the bellary pancreatitis, you can actually visualize. And sometimes uh, because ERCP, you can put the stents as well uh, uh, through this um, endoscopic uh, guided, uh, which is the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram gram, right? So actually, MRCP tells you about the dilatation of the stone in the CBD and ERCP is actually a kind of a procedure in which um, the, there's a visualization of the whole of the track and also uh, you can put the uh, stents as well for the drainage 
uh, because there's obstruction and also obstruction is going to cause the obstructive jaundice. So to relieve the symptoms of the patient, uh, you put this tense uh, through the ERCP. You can see the endoscope enters through the mouth, passes through the stomach. Uh, you can see the common hepatic, you can see the cystic, and you can see the uh, common bowel duct as well, right? So the endoscope is coming into the uh, common bowel duct, and you can see the, uh, the main pancreatic duct is actually entering into the, this uh, part of the duodenum. So uh, this is a kind of important uh, uh, in investigation. So this is the endoscopic tube. You can visualize the whole of the, this is the gallbladder, the cystic duct, the hepatic, the common hepatic, and this is the, actually the, um, this is the pancreatic duct. You can see the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct as well, right? So uh, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. And you, it can also tell you about the part of the distal obstruction, and it's going to give you information about the uh, strictures, if, if any kind of the stricture is present. It will tell you about the normal pancreatic duct, and it will tell you about the dilated pancreatic duct because it's gonna give you kind of a caliber of the duct, which is also like very much important because if there's obstruction in the, um, in the uh, distal part of the duct, and also there, there could be a kind of a stone, uh, which was initially in the gall gallbladder and it got slipped into the CBD and it's then causing the obstructive jaundice, right? So the ERCP is important investigation for that because it's going to tell you about the main pancreatic duct, the caliber, you know, the whole of the channel for the drainage of the bile. So uh, it's going to tell you if there's a blockage uh, because uh, of the, you know, the stone, uh, there would be a typical sign, which is the double duct sign, uh, which can be, you know, you can see here, because uh, this is the double duct sign, so that's kind of important um, uh, important uh, sign to pick up in case of the uh, malignant stricture in the lower part of the common bile duct. So if there's a stricture in the lower part of the common bile duct and there's a stricture in the main pancreatic duct, so that's going to make a double duct sign. Right, and also you can appreciate the chronic pancreatitis as well in the ERCP because it's going to tell you about the strictures as well, right? So, in case of the relapsing acute pancreatitis, there would be uh, you know the adamatous. Uh, wall of the pancreas, there would be pericholecystic fluid uh, that would be visible in the ultrasonography and the endoscopic retrograde cholangiography as well. So uh, actually, if you could see here in the diagram that this is actually the common hepatic and it's going to make combined with the cystic and it's going to make the common bile duct. So this is actually the common bile duct. There's the common hepatic, the cystic, they're going to make a common bile duct. So if there's a stricture in the main pancreatic, you can see there's a pancreas, and there's a stricture in the pancreas that can be picked up in the ERCP, right? And if obviously if there's a stricture in the distal part, the proximal segment would be dilated, and this dilatation would be picked up in the ERCP. And you can also uh, appreciate if, if there's a partial failed cyst or it's a kind of a pseudo cyst, which is a complication uh, um, after the acute pancreatitis. So you can see that as well. You can the uh, you can see the proximal uh, this uh, proximal distension as well, and you can see the dilated pancreatic duct as well. So uh, it's also important uh, in case of the chronic pancreatitis because it's going to give you kind of information uh, related to the strictures because. Uh, in case of the chronic pancreatitis, uh, there would be formation of the strictures. So you can actually find the irregular margins of the uh, malignant strictures as well. There would be dilated chain of legs. There would be stricture in the chronic pancreatitis, which is, you can see here in the diagram that in case of the ERCP and in case of the chronic pancreatitis, there's actually the dilated chain of legs and you can see the stricture as well. So the ERCP is a, a very important investigation because it, it, can, it can be helpful in a case of stenting as well because ERCP guided stenting is also done. 
as a therapeutic procedure. So uh, sometimes plant radiographs they can be uh, they can be helpful because they're going to show the opaque uh, um, uh, um, opaque uh, stone as well, right? So uh, they can be. Um, if if there is a mass, they can, like it in a carcinoma, so that can also be be visible in case of ERCB. So there's an important investigation which is the endoscopic ultrasound, and this is somehow very much important because it's a kind of uh, endoscopic guided ultrasound. So actually, uh, the tip of uh, you know that endoscope, uh, endoscopic ultrasound, the tip of the um, uh, that probe is actually very much sensitive and is a kind of uh, um, that uh, you know very much sensitive to the uh, sonographic waves. So it's a kind of a special uh, investigation. It's the endoscopic ultrasound. It's helpful in the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas because it, it's going to, because it's a high frequency sonographic, um, uh, sonographic uh, probe or the endoscope. So it's, kind, it, it's helpful in picking up the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas. And because of this, uh, you can take the aspiration uh, biopsy as well through this. So let's, uh, this was about the pancreatic uh, surgical anatomy. And we also discussed about the, some of the investigation. We're gonna talk about a little bit of the congenital anomalies, which, can, uh, which we can encounter in case of the pancreatitis. So the first anatomy of the first abnormality we're gonna discuss is the congenital and it's a cystic fibrosis. So actually this in cystic fibrosis, uh, there is a there is a mutation uh, on a gene which is the CFTR and which is a cystic fibrosis transmembrane uh, regulator uh, and um, it, this this is the gene which is located on the chromosome seven so because of the mutations on that particular genes. And there's some problem with the chloride channels. And because of the chloride channels, there would be a lot of uh, secretions like the sodium and the chloride uh, content would be more in the sweat. And you know, the clearance and the drainage of these secretion uh, would be difficult. And because of the impaction or because of the, uh, you know, the stasis of the secretion, because they, because of the deficiency of the CFTR gene, because of some problem with the chloride channels, uh, obviously, uh, the secretions won't be drained and there would be pooling and they're going to cause like uh, so the they, they can be uh, the chronic pulmonary disease because of the thick uh, mucoid secretions of, uh, and the bronchi and the bronchioles which are not cleared uh, because of the uh, CFTR mutations right and obviously uh, sometimes they then there can be uh, some problem with the uh, with the SNR cells because those normal SNR cells they are uh, you know uh, they're replaced by the thick secretions and because of that uh, they they would be uh, they would be problem with the exocrine uh, function of the gland and because of that they would be pancreatitis they would be acute or the chronic pancreatitis right and Sometimes uh, the patient, uh, in case of the a male patient, there would be some problem with vas deferens, and there would be infertility because of that. And because uh, in female, uh, if uh, if the if uh, cystic fibrosis is present in a female, then there would be thick cervical uh, mucus, and obviously it can interfere with the sperm penetration. So it's actually an autosomal recessive condition. And there are mutations in the CFTR, which is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator genes on the chromosome 7. And it's a kind of a multi-system disorder because involving the respiratory system as well, the, uh, the chronic pulmonary diseases. It's involving the GIT as well, and it's involving the genitourinary uh, system as well. And there would be a lot of secretion of sodium and the chloride in the sweat. And obviously, because of that, there would be um, imbalance in the electrolytes as well. They can cause the metabolic deficiency and as well and blockage of the passages by the thick secretions. 
So uh, you can see here, in case if it's involving the lungs, there would be COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or the carpulmonale. In case of the DIT, there would be pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, and they're going to lead to the blockage. They could be, but in case of the short term, they're not going to cause a lot of problem, but in long-term cases, it would be developed in older older patients. It gonna, it, it's going to be developed into a full-blown diabetes mellitus, and obviously, there would be uh, there would be bile duct plugging and the hepatic SNI, they would be plugged as well. And because of that, there would be cirrhosis of the liver and infertility uh, in males and females. Females, because of the thick cervical mucus, and, uh, and it's going to interfere with the sperm penetration. And in case of the uh, uh, in case of males, there would be some problem with the mortality of the sperm and the vas as well. So obviously the clinical signs would be poor growth, poor appetite, and you know, the rancid, greasy stools. And because of that, like because of the, uh, the deficiency of the pancreatic enzymes, uh, there would be fat malabsorption. And because of the fat malabsorption, there would be a uh, sticky, greasy stool. And sometimes uh, when the patient passes, that the baby passes the meconium, it's thick, very much thick. That gives you impression of the steroria, right? And there would be abdominal distension as well, chronic respiratory disease, and there would be clubbing of the fingers. So the clinic, clinical signs for the cystic fibrosis, poor growth, poor appetite, greasy, greasy stools because of the steroria and mal fatty malabsorption because of the enzymatic deficiency of the pancreas, the chronic respiratory disease, and there would be clubbing of the fingers as well. So uh, an important uh, test for the cystic fibrosis is genetic testing, and you're going to go and test the CFTR mutations. Uh, another common test is a sweat chloride test in which you measure actually the quantity of the sodium and the chloride. And in, ca in case of the cystic fibrosis, there would be increased amount of sodium and the chloride. So uh, always uh, keep in mind, you actually put the collecting device on the patient uh, with its electrodes and they actually measure the quantity of the sodium and the chloride. So particularly if we talk about the treatment uh, modalities we have available for the cystic fibrosis, is like aggressive, Physiotherapy, uh, putting uh, the patient in a diet, uh, like low in fat, high in salt, because most commonly the, the sodium, the chloride salts, they are, uh, they are actually excreted from the body and they're, they're more, uh, they're lost uh, in, in, uh, in case of the sweat. So you have to replace them. Uh, so there should be a high salt diet, uh, fat, low fat diet, uh, oral pancreatic enzymatic preparation and you can also put the patient on the antibiotics and at the end stage because if it's causing this the OPD you're going to put the patient on bronchodilators as well but at the end stage you're going to go for the lung transplantation. There's another condition which is the pancreatic divism. We actually know that the dorsal pancreatic duct and the ventral pancreatic duct they actually fuse together and um, at the end, they actually uh, to actually form the uh, adult structure of the pancreas, right? But uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, there, there there is problem or the delay in the fusion of the ventral and the dorsal pancreatic duct, and because of that, that leads to the division of the pancreas, which is the pancreatic divism, right? Actually, there's the normal pancreas, the ventral, and the uh, dorsal pancreatic duct, they actually fuse at the end, but if they do not, there would be a pancreatic uh, divism. And how are you going to diagnose? Obviously, you're going to diagnose on MRCP and you're going di to diagnose this on endoscopic ultrasonography. So in case what you actually do in a pancreatic divism, actually you um, actually go for the endoscopic sphincterotomy with the help of that, um, you know, 
that particular endoscope which is used for the ERCP, you put the endoscope and you actually uh, dilate or you just open the, the sphincter for the drainage which is called as endoscopic sphincterotomy. So you're going to put the endoscope or up through mouth going down from the stomach crossing across the pancreas, this is the, gall, uh, this is the gallbladder, and you can see the endoscope, right? So the, this, um, the distal part of the endoscope is actually doing, performing the sphincterotomy, uh, actually. So for the treatment, uh, the first uh, treatment for the pancreatic divism is a sphincteroplasty, or sometimes you have to create a bypass with it, which is actually a pancreatic ojedonostomy, and sometimes you can all, you need to resect the pancreatic head as well. So there's another entity, which is called the annular pancreas, and if you could see here in the diagram, actually, this is the, if we talk about the normal, uh, normal pancreas, the, these, the pancreatic duct along with the uh, common bile duct, they enter into the, there's some kind of a problem uh, with the, with the dorsal pancreatic duct. And because of that, the main pancreatic duct, instead of opening into the major duodenal papilla, it enters into the minor duodenal papilla, so they are called as annular pancreas. So this annular pancreas is actually uh, compressing the ample of the vetter, and because of that, um, uh, mostly the annular pancreas, they're related, uh, they're more common in the patient with the Down syndrome, and they're more, they are causing, like, they, the, because of the obstruction of the sphincter, the patient present with a bilious vomiting and also related to the biliary, uh, biliary atresia as well, right? So you can see here in the diagram, this is the annular pancreas, the sassary part of the pancreas, which, has, which is actually present uh, in the second part of the duodenum and it's causing the compression and obviously uh, leading to the obstructive symptoms, right? So uh, there would be a kind of a, uh, you know, accessory pancreatic tissue around the duodenum and obviously the second part of the duodenum would be compressed and it's kind of related to the congenital duodenal stenosis or atresia. It's more common in the patient with the Down syndrome and uh, there would be a continuous uh, vomiting in the neonate and especially the bilious vomiting because it's going to inter uh, interfere with the normal drainage. So the um, the, the treatment option is you're going to go, go for the duodenostomy in such patients or the resection of the head of the pancreas. So there's another entity, a congenital anomaly, there's an ectopic pancreas. And in case of the ectopic pancreas, the pancreatic tissue is somewhere else, maybe in the spleen, in the liver, in the CBD. So this um, ectopic tissue can be found anywhere uh, involving the splenic part, involving the duodenum, involving the uh, part of the, uh, you know, the liver, in the submucosal part of the stomach, in the duodenum, small intestine, gallbladder, um, you know, adjoining the pancreas, or it can be in the hilum of this spleen and within the liver. So it can be uh, in the wall of the GIT, uh, which is actually forming the duplication cyst. So the last, um, uh, you know, the congenital anomaly we're going to discuss is the congenital cystic diseases of the pancreas. So there can be, uh, like we know that there are some, you know, the 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 there's other diseases like the uh, liver cyst or the you know adult polycystic kidney disease, uh, they can be very cyst. So there can be some kind of congenital cyst, uh, which are also a part of the, um, uh, you know, the pancreas. Uh, so there can be some kind of the congenital cyst. And if they they are not symptomatic, uh, you leave them as it is. But if they get, they're going to, um, um, you know, causing kind of obstruction or they become symptomatic, uh, you're going to go for the resection, right? So they can be like kind of a cystic adenoma, they can be a pseudocyst, or they can be a kind of a cystic neoplasm, or they need an assisted adenoma. You have to be very much careful uh, dealing with a serocystic adenoma or the mesen, especially the mesen assisted adenoma, because if you are uh, going to resect uh, or you know the drain that particular cyst and it burst in the abdomen, it can it it's it's kind of a very a dangerous thing and it will there would be seeding in the whole of the abdomen and it will you know the it will lead to the death of the patient after some time. 
So there can be some congenital diseases like the papillary cystic tumor, there can be cystic eyelid uh, cell tumor. So this was about the congenital anomalies of the pancreas and the next uh, uh, you know, uh, in today's topic, we mainly um, um, discuss about the surgical anatomy. We discuss about uh, the uh, kind of the investigations we have available to investigate the pathology of the pancreas. And at the end, we also discuss about a little bit about the congenital anomalies. In the next lecture, we'll be discussing about the acute and the chronic pancreatitis and other inflammatory condition of the pancreas and also uh, some of the malignant and the benign tumors of the the pancreas. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching Scadia.com. Keep watching Scadia.com.